first chapter, uh, particularly, we've seen Paul encouraging Timothy in three areas in chapter one. The first thing that Timothy was encouraged to do was to teach sound doctrine, to teach sound doctrine. And last week, we looked at the encouragement to preach the gospel. And then today, we're going to be looking at defending your faith. And really, what an encouragement it has been so far. And this amazing letter, yes, for pastors to read, but also for Christians uh, to hold on to these encouragements for yourself. And I really have found that it's brought just such hope in the Lord as our church revisits the importance of, as it says, teaching the Bible and preaching the gospel, knowing that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And last week, I thought it was so powerful, and maybe you can attest to this as well, the the power of Paul's personal testimony of how the Lord radically changed his life and how he was the least worthy person to receive the forgiveness of God, the, the one that we would have considered the furthest away. As you remember, he was arresting Christians, and he was shutting down churches, and he was breathing threats and acts of violence. And the Lord met him exactly where he was at and turned him in the complete opposite direction. And what an amazing testimony we looked at. If you would look at verse 15, let's read the three verses following. Verses actually, we'll read 15, 16, and 17. But it says here that this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. Verse 16, however, for this reason, I obtain mercy that in me first, Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. The more that I study the scriptures, the more that I spend time with the Lord, the more that I grow in what is still a limited understanding of who God is and who Jesus is, I wonder why Jesus is hated so much. I wonder how it can be that there are people that will get so angry when the gospel is shared, really the good news is shared that Jesus came to the world to save people who are not perfect, to save people who have made mistakes, to save people who in God's economy have sinned. I mean, for me, even on a personal note, the fact that Jesus came to save sinners and the only requirement to receive God's forgiveness and love and mercy and grace is that you are a sinner, I have found that I meet those requirements nicely. And I think in verse 17, piggybacking on what Paul is just experiencing as this amazing movement, of amazing act of God's love, a movement of the Holy Spirit upon his life, he says, now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You can't help but wonder what must have been going, have been going through Paul's mind as he's reflecting on the great things that God had done for him. The kind of guilt that he experienced as he was hurting Jesus as That voice on the road to Damascus, which we know was Jesus' voice speaking to the man formerly known as Saul. And he said, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you? And he said, I am Jesus whom you persecute. That the very one that he was hurting and sinning against was the very one that laid down his life that he might be forgiven. And so as you see in verse 17, Paul goes from looking back at where he came from, the power of the gospel to save, how he was going to be the example to those who would believe of God's long suffering, God's patience, God's forgiveness and love, that if God could take Paul and save his life, he could do that with anyone. 
And he immediately, it's almost as if he gets transported into this place of praise of just saying, God, you alone are wise. Lord, you are worthy of all praise. Lord, you are eternal. Your plans are so far beyond our finding out. What a good and gracious and loving and merciful and forgiving God you are. And what an amazing thing we read last week and we studied the power of the gospel. No one can be too far gone not even the enemy of Jesus is beyond the reach of his forgiveness. And because of the great things that the Lord did in Paul's life, we see it now possible for others to experience as well. I wonder how many of you here today, as we think upon these things, maybe listening or watching this service, have seen your potential realized in service to the Lord. I wonder how many of you may even be here that are or listening or watching this that are against the church or against Jesus. I wonder if you are going to see the great love that God has for you. The great plans that God has for you unfolded in your life. Then you too as Paul as we read and as we've studied, you can proclaim, God, you're so wise. You're so gracious. Thank you for forgiving me of all of my sin, of all the wrong that I have ever done. Even when I was against you, God, you loved me still. Thank you. Thank you. And let's read our new section for today with Paul's encouragement to defend the faith in verse 18 of 1 Timothy chapter 1. It says, this charge I commit to you, Son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwrecked, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. That's our section that we're going to cover today this very interesting passage. And would you please join with me as we pray. Father, we ask that you would now give us ears to hear what your spirit would say to your church. We ask, Lord, that as we look at these verses of scripture, that you would add your blessing, that you would move by the power of your Holy Spirit. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Timothy... And might I just make it personal to you, the reader today, Christian, wage the good spiritual warfare. I don't know if you've realized this yet or not. I'm sure most of you have. That every single day of your life as a Christian is a spiritual battle. Just this morning, Skip Heitzig said, that the spiritual life that we live in, walking as a Christian, it's a battleground, not a playground. And it's very true. Very true. From the thoughts that you think, the desires that you feel, the interactions that you have with those around you, every day there is a spiritual war taking place. And I like to highlight this truth from the book of Job, where we get a very fascinating insight to what takes place in the world from a spiritual standpoint. In Job chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation, though our text mainly is from the New King James Version. It says... In Job chapter 1, one day the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord, and the accuser, Satan, came with them. Where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan. Satan answered the Lord, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. Now Satan... He is a created being. He is not omnipresent, nor is he omniscient, but he is a very powerful, evil angel. He does present himself before the Lord and give an account for his whereabouts. And his whereabouts, as we have just read, is patrolling the earth and watching everything that is going on. 
See, this spiritual battle is invisible. It's happening in the spiritual realm, a realm that we cannot see with our physical eyes. There is an additional tremendous account of eyes being opened to the spiritual realm found in 2 Kings. This is the Old Testament book of 2 Kings chapter 6. I'm going to read a chunk of scripture to you. And so if you'd like to turn there in your Bibles or turn there as I'm reading. This is 2 Kings chapter 6. The setting is laid out for us in these first few verses and then you will see what happens. Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel. And he consulted with his servants saying, my camp will be in such and such a place. In verse nine of 2 Kings chapter six, it says, and the man of God sent to the king of Israel saying, beware that you do not pass this place for the Syrians are coming down there. So this man of God, this prophet known as Elisha, was given this supernatural insight to where the enemy of Israel would be encamped. And so every time the king of of Syria would make these plans and set his battle array, his encampment up, he would now, Elisha would now go directly to the king of Israel and say, hey, they're camped out over here. They're laying traps over there. Don't go in that direction. Interesting. But listen to what it says. Then the king of Israel sent someone, verse 10, to the place which the man of God had told him. And thus he warned him and he was watchful there, not just once or twice, meaning this just kept happening over and over to the point, therefore, that the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? He says, this is too crazy, too coincidental. How is it that every single time the people of Israel slip by? How are we always wrong? Somebody is giving inside information to Israel. And in verse 12, one of the king of Syria's servants said, there are none that are spying, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom." And so he said, go and see where he is that I may send and get him. And it was told him saying, surely he's in Dothan. Therefore, the king of Syria sent horses and chariots and a great army there. And they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of Elisha arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, alas, my master, what shall we do? And so he answered, do not fear. Listen to this. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And so when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. And there's just an amazing story that follows after this section. But what I found so interesting here is that we gain an insight to what's happening in the spiritual realm. We have on one hand, Satan patrolling the entire world, seeking to find out what's going on. He's involved in a lot of things. He gives an account for his whereabouts as those in the heavenly court, if you will, present themselves before God. We see in the Old Testament as well in 2 Kings, how though there was this army encamped around Elisha, the army of the Lord was encamped around the enemy, encamped around Elisha. And he prayed, Lord, open my servant's heart so that he might see who is actually with us. And the same applies for us today, that there is a spiritual battle that is taking place. So often we attach ourselves to what we can see or feel or touch, something that's tangible, something that's visible. But the real battle is invisible. The real battle is taking place behind the scenes. We need to be aware of that. Paul wrote that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, rulers, in the heavenly places. You might think, well, it's the mayor. 
or it's the governor, or it's the boss, or it's the president, or it's the whatever that person may be that is causing you aggro. You might think that, oh, it's this person or that person that's coming against me. But what you need to understand is that if you desire to do what is right before God, if you desire to live your life pleasing to the Lord, you're going to face opposition. And the opposition that is coming against you is spiritually, spiritually based. And so when you go to fight things in the physical realm, that are really needing to be fought in the spiritual realm, you'll fall. And if the enemy can get us to fight spiritual battles with our physical abilities, he will win. But if we fight spiritual battles in the spiritual realm with the power of the Holy Spirit working through us, then we win. And so that begs the question, as Paul says, wage good warfare The question being, well, what kind of warfare being waged is a good one? And the simple answer to that is the one that you win. The one that you win. Timothy was a Christian in a very wicked culture, Ephesus, where he resided. And that would also be where he would be called to minister. And as a Christian, when you're surrounded by evil on all sides, it can be very discouraging. It can be very disheartening. Yet Paul was commissioning Timothy, even as I would say we've been commissioned today as soldiers with this charge, wage good warfare. Paul will write later on in his second letter in chapter two, verse four, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And so for us as a Christian, as Christians, our main focus, and I will say for me personally, my main focus cannot be and should never be upon how my service unto the Lord pleases me. How does my service unto the Lord please me? All too often is the case where we place conditions upon our service unto the Lord and our willingness to heed the call to serve the Lord is predicated upon our pleasure involved in such a calling. Do I like this? Is this what I picked? Is this on my ministry wish list? Is this how I said I would serve the Lord or is it something that I did not volunteer for? Because when you're going down the list of opportunities to serve the Lord, I thought I put my name in this column over here, and now I have found myself in the unpleasant column over here. How did that happen? See, this is one of the main things. The main things, this is a major thing, and it's everywhere. One of the main things is that the modern churchgoer has completely missed, quite frankly, even I, could completely miss that if I'm so entangled in the affairs of this life and that my deciding factor on whether or not I serve the Lord is based upon whether or not I like it, then I am ineffective. Then I am becoming as if I were a Christian mercenary. Lord, I will serve you if you kick down. Lord, I will do this if you pay me properly. Or if, Lord, you reward me handsomely. Or if people are are shouting my praises, then Lord, I will do it. Lord, if it's easy, if it's pleasurable, if it's nice, then I'll serve you, Lord. It's at that point that I've completely lost the point of what it means to sacrifice, what it means to be obedient, what it means to serve what it means to do hard things, uncomfortable things, if the Lord requires that of me. It's very, very rare that the follower of Jesus will be called to do something that would be considered a nice, cush ministry that doesn't require any effort, doesn't require breaking a sweat, doesn't require sacrifice or hardships. I mean, I wonder 
in this theme of defending the faith, and as Paul will use time and time again these words to describe military operations as, you know, I charge you, as a commanding officer would to those beneath him, I charge you, I give you this order. Keep the faith. I wonder, as I thought upon this, how many things Jesus did that were actually pleasurable? When you read the Gospels, I wonder how many things we do for Jesus that are not pleasant, that are not convenient, and that are not easy. As we read from 2 Timothy chapter 2, a good soldier seeks not how to please himself, but how to please the Lord. And that good soldier of the Lord wages a good warfare through holding fast to faith and a good conscience. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And in light of this, one of the most discouraging things that comes to us, that comes to me, that comes to you as a follower of Jesus is at times the lack of tangible, visible fruit from our service. As you recall from a couple weeks back, if Satan can't get you with disobedience, he'll try to get you with discouragement. If he can't get you to disobey and no longer serve the Lord, then as you desire to serve the Lord and step out in obedience to that calling, he'll try to discourage you from doing what's right. And see, that discouragement that we face as Christians is directly related to our physical senses. It is. It's not a spiritually discerned type of thing. It is a physically discerned discouragement. I can't see it. I don't understand it. I'm just not feeling this right now. And here are some common questions really that pop into our heads when we're getting discouraged in our service or obedience to the Lord. And maybe you can relate to this. I've jotted a few of them down. These questions that pop into our heads go such as, do you see anything good coming from this yet? Maybe you look at your wife. Do you see anything good happening because of this? I mean, I know this was the right decision, but this is like turning into a real bust. Or maybe something pops in to your head uh, and, and you're thinking, how is all of this effort for no apparent reason making me feel right now. All this effort that I'm putting in in my quote-unquote service to the Lord and doing what he's calling me to do, doing the right thing, being that man, being that woman that God has created me to be, how is this making me feel right now because it seems that I'm doing this for no apparent reason? Maybe you've wondered. Maybe you've asked. How am I able to grasp anything positive as to where I am right now. Does this seem like a big waste of time? Why am I here? Why am I doing this? Can you see it? Can you feel it? Can you hold it? And all of these questions place doubt in our minds and they're at the surface level, the physical nature, only questions such things. Hey, I'm not seeing it. I'm not feeling it. I'm not understanding it. And for that reason, Christian follower, Christian soldier, servant, faith, and a clear conscience are so important in your life. They're so important to the servant of the Lord because in your marriage, discouragement sets in. In your parenting, discouragement sets in. In your relationships, discouragement sets in. And so does it in your job and even in your personal relationship with Jesus, discouragement can set in. In your service to the Lord, if you're volunteering, if you are contributing, discouragement can set in because you wonder, oh, it, what I'm doing, is it even worth it? It's hard, 
It requires sacrifice. It requires commitment. And sometimes you just don't want to be inconvenienced by it. And Paul reminds Timothy of the things that the Lord spoke to him in times past. And this is so important for us because, you know, you may not feel like doing the right thing. You may not feel like doing the things that please the Lord. Maybe you're discouraged because you're putting in the effort. You're investing your time, your resources. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing, and you don't see anything coming from it. We've all been there. And really, that can apply to so many different areas of our lives. So many different areas where it seems like, Lord, I'm trying to do the right thing, but it doesn't really seem to be panning out. And so Paul says, Timothy, you're going to experience discouragement. You're going to wonder, why are you here? Why are you in this city? Why are you in this church? Why are you following the Lord? Don't forget the things that the Lord has done for you in the past because they will give you hope and encouragement when you don't see how it's going to work out in the future. And in verse 18 again, he says, I charge This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you. And apparently, there were those in the church that were used by the Lord in exercising one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the gift of prophecy. Yes, this word prophecy can cover the words of exhortation, but can also, it can also cover things that have not yet happened, things that are for an appointed time that pertain to you in the future. Paul told Timothy, don't forget those things that the Lord has revealed to you in the past, for those things will bring reassurance during your times of discouragement. How quickly we forget the great things that God has done in the past. Isn't it true? I mean, really, isn't isn't it true? How we can come to the end of ourselves the end of our resources, we have nowhere to go. God shows himself strong in our behalf. He does this miraculous work that we thought wasn't possible and we are rejoicing and praising God and then some time goes past. And then we get hit with the next thing and we forget what God has done. Don't forget the great things that the Lord has done because during those times when you question God's provision and you question God's love and his calling upon your life with all the outside influences, the ones that we should let into our lives are the ones that are according to God's word. Timothy would face all types of difficulties with people in the church and people outside the church. Yet the things that would be spoken against Timothy as an attack of the enemy should fall on deaf ears. But the things spoken to him from the word of God should bring him great encouragement. You know, somebody can share with you a a scripture or maybe they shoot you a text or it pops up in your email or maybe they just say, hey, you know, in person they share something with you that's encouraging from the Lord and you know it to be true. Why does it seem that the voice of negativity, the voice of condemnation, the voice of the enemy or those that the enemy would so choose to use to discourage you seem to be so much louder at times than the still small voice of the Holy Spirit? And we'll be so caught off guard or so distracted by these attacks of the enemy that we forget the great power in the living word of God. Hold fast. To the word of God. See, the gift of prophecy is not just something that was used in the past with Timothy. It's still in use today. For those of you that don't know, this church is a part of the Calvary Chapel Association of Churches. I came out of Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa, which was my home church for a number of years. Really, since I was in utero, I was singing the Lord's Prayer. We laugh about it. I don't know if you know this at all, but the founding pastor of the Calvary Chapel movement, Chuck Smith, he shared this story that, now listen to this, this is mind-blowing to me, that for over 17 years, 
For his first 17 years in the ministry, he was extremely discouraged, quote, unquote, that nothing effective had come from his ministry. 17 years. And there was this group of Christians, and they were friends of Chuck's, and they were praying for one another. And if I recall the story correctly, that they had just a chair that, you know, they would have somebody sit in, and they would all lay hands, and they would pray. And they prayed for Chuck. 17 years in, and God gave them a prophetic word, and I actually wrote this down so you could hear it verbatim. And I quote Chuck here, and God began to tell of the ministry that he was going to give me. This is from a personal standpoint as they're praying over Pastor Chuck. They start to pray and tell of this ministry that God was going to give to me and of the way that the church would be blessed and the way that the church would grow. It seemed at that time like it was so totally unlikely. That time the Lord actually said that he was going to give me a new name, which meant shepherd, because he was going to make me the shepherd of many flocks. Before I came down here to Calvary Chapel, a group of people were in prayer as to whether or not I should come down. They had asked me to come down and to take over here at Calvary Chapel, and, there were, and they were in prayer in regards to it. And the Lord spoke to them through prophecy and said that I was going to be coming down and that the Lord was going to bless the church abundantly, that we were going to, the church would be outgrowing that facility. We would be moving to a new facility on the bluff overlooking the bay and that God would continue to bless until the church would be known around the world. There would be a national radio ministry. And God laid out so many things that have since come to pass through the word of prophecy. End of quote. And as you know, some 40 years passed since Chuck Smith took over Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa when it was a little country church on the edge of town there in Santa Ana and Costa Mesa. And this prophetic word was given and it came to pass. It came to the forefront. Something that seemed so unlikely was a fulfillment of God's plan. And so for us, we can draw upon the faithfulness of the Lord in our past to encourage us in the future. But what if you're here today and you haven't had that experience of someone praying over you and prophesying over you, or maybe you're here and you're like, I've never even had anyone encourage me. You know, Peter had this amazing experience on what is called the Mount of Transfiguration where Moses and Elijah joined Jesus on the mount there. Peter heard God the Father say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. But you know what was even more important than hearing that and seeing this miraculous supernatural occurrence? Even more important than Peter's personal experience was the written word of God. He writes to this end in 2 Peter 1.19, and this is in the context of the story I just shared. He says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that you take heed as unto a light, as the old King James says, shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Did you have a more sure word of prophecy? The word of God. Through the darkness of this world, the word of God is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Knowing the scriptures is so important in waging a good warfare in the spirit. So many of the heresies that are circulating in the church abroad today come from taking scriptures out of context, removing scriptures completely, or adding to what the scriptures say. And so when you, the church, are faced with a crisis or you find yourself in a dilemma having to make a tough decision, I cannot stress enough to you today how important it is that you make a biblical decision. And how are you to make a biblically-based decision if you don't know what the Bible says? You know, a few years back, we were faced with some situations that were heartbreaking and the Lord walked us through every step of the way. If it were not for the Lord, it would have been devastating. Yet one night, true story, 
as I was sitting with the elders of the church in my living room and as we were praying over the church, the Lord gave me this word and it was a single word and it was surrender. Surrender. And it wasn't in the context of giving up. It wasn't in the context of backing down from what we know to be the right thing to do. The way that the Lord impressed it upon my heart was that every time that I felt overwhelmed, every time that this was, this discouragement came my way, every time I heard of, you know, someone else or something else happening, that I was to take that and surrender it to the Lord. Surrender it to the Lord. Give it to him. Let the Lord fight the battle. Let the Lord do what only he can do. And at that exact moment, as we're sitting in our living room, my phone buzzed from a good friend of mine. And he says, I don't know what this means to you, but there is a good friend of mine. This woman's filled with the Holy Spirit. And she said that the Lord had given her a word to give to you. And she said, she doesn't know anything about anything. And this is for you for what it's worth. And in that text was the word surrender. Surrender it, surrender it. Though the wound is deep, the Lord will heal. And I shared that with the guys and I thought, how cool is that, that the Holy Spirit still works today? That every single time we're faced with something that's so far outside of our control, we will do what God has called us to do. We will act, but we must surrender these things to the Lord that are outside of our control. It was a prophetic word for us. No one could have known that. I had just shared it in real time, and I had shared it to none other but my wife moments before. Often it may seem that the Lord's not hearing your prayers. He's not seeing your plight. But might I just assure you today, God is very well aware of what's happening. And he is very, at, and he is very much at work in your life through the trial that you're currently in. The truth is, is that you often don't see it. The temptation is, because you don't see it, because you don't see Jesus at work in it, you don't believe it. So the truth is, again, that the Lord is at work in you. The temptation is, because you don't see it, you don't believe it. And I think this is one of the reasons why John chapter 20, verse 29, recur, uh, records what Jesus said where he spoke, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. In this life, blessed are you when you believe God and you don't see it. And you don't understand it. And you can't feel it or hold it. And you don't know if anything good's coming from it. But you're stepping out in obedience to the Lord. You're holding fast to your faith. And you don't know how it's going to turn out. Blessed are you when you believe in Jesus when you don't see him. Because faith is, as I read from Hebrews, the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. You could even say it's believing in something substantively that you cannot see yet. And so as Timothy was to follow Jesus into the spiritual battle in Ephesus, he would need to draw upon the past faithfulness of the Lord and to hold fast to his faith and good conscience. I have found in my personal and in my public life, and I hope that this encourages you because it took me a long time to get there. I have found that if, what, that if I know that what I'm doing is biblical, if I know that it is right before the Lord, that's number one. Secondly, if my wife and I, before the Lord, before the scriptures, have a clear conscience that we feel good about this before the Lord and in our consciences, in both of our conscience that I'm okay, I'm good then. If there's biblical precedent, if me and Ruth are on the same page because I trust her more than anybody else, 
I know that regardless of what may come my way, regardless of who may not like it, regardless of who gets upset, or whatever the fallout may be from there, I know that I am doing the right thing. Listen to me. Listen. If you can make a decision that has biblical support and you have a clear conscience before God, then make the decision. Don't vacillate. Don't go back and forth. Don't don't weigh it out. If God's calling you to do something and there is biblical precedent, meaning it doesn't go against God's word and you have a clear conscience about it, act. Because you will find that after time goes by, that because the word of the Lord endures forever, so will, so will the lasting righteous effect of your decision and actions be. In the long run, it goes well for the righteous and poorly with the wicked. So hold fast, white knuckle it to your faith and your good conscience because some reject their faith and ignore their conscience. Warren Wiersbe wrote, and I quote, bad doctrine usually starts with bad conduct and usually with secret sin. So wage the good warfare, Timothy, having faith and a good conscience, which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwrecked, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Don't do what they did. They rejected their faith. They went against their God-given conscience, and they wrecked their lives. These two men shipwrecked themselves. These men are believed to be those that have taught false doctrine, those that caused problems in the church, and they were removed. They were removed from the church and noted by name. This being delivered to Satan is a pretty serious thing. It's a pretty serious thing. The Bible doesn't go into details exactly on what Paul might, or what he exactly means by this, but there's something that does take place to you when you're outside the, of the will of God. When you are outside righteousness, when you're outside of obedience, if you're in sin, it would seem that there is a certain level of protection that you forego when you step into sin, when you are disobedient to the Lord. Yes, God is gracious. God is merciful. God is long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We know that to be true. And because of God's long-suffering, the moment we veer off in disobedience, we don't necessarily get smote by lightning. But there is something that you must be made aware of that if you're in sin and you continue in sin, that the Lord will allow Satan to buffet you in such a manner that hopefully you repent from your sin, that you realize the error of your way, and that you come back to following the Lord. Sin may be pleasurable for a season, but in the end it bites and it hurts, and it leaves you empty. And then you start experiencing the consequences of sin. And that's where Satan has a field day with you now that he has you in a place of disobedience to God. You are outside the center of God's perfect will. And we pray that the Lord has mercy on those that have chosen to willfully disobey God and to reject their faith to override their conscience. But Timothy, don't do what these guys did. You here today, hold fast to your faith. Teach sound doctrine. Preach the gospel. Defend your faith. 
You know, he, Paul goes from saying, I charge you, which is a, a term that would be used in the army to hold fast, which is a term that would be used in the Navy as you're holding fast to the ropes attached to the sail. I think you understand what he's trying to say here. Is that you're going to hit storms. You're going to run into opposition. People are not going to like you. Because they hated Jesus, they'll hate you also as a servant greater than his master. We saw the effects of rejecting a good conscience and rejecting a faith, rejecting a faith of Hymenaeus and Alexander. Don't do that. Timothy, teach sound doctrine, preach the gospel, hold on to your faith because those around you need the truth. Because you're called to serve in a very difficult place. And don't worry, God uses unworthy people. But you serve a great God. Timothy, do what God's called you to do because you're in a battle and you cannot surrender. Timothy, serve the Lord without giving up, because not everybody does. And so church, we are called, we are commissioned, we're charged to be in this world, but not of this world to do the things that please God rather than please ourselves or please other people. We're called to actually put in effort to fight the good fight, to wage the good warfare. And if we're truly a follower of Jesus, we are not going to put stipulations upon how we will serve the Lord. There should be no conditions it should be, Lord, what do you want done? I'm your man. Or I'm your woman. We'll get it done. Not, oh, I don't know if I like this. Ah, oh, it's not really convenient. Ah, oh, it's too hard. No, listen, there's no too hard. There's no inconvenience. There's none of that. Because if there is, you've immediately taken yourself out. You've now become ineffective. I don't want to be ineffective. I don't want to be the man that backs down when things get hard. I don't want to be the type of man whose character is so shallow that I won't make the right decision because it might cost me something or it might require effort or it may be difficult or I just don't feel like it. May all of us be able to say with our whole hearts, Lord, here I am, send me. Lord, you want me to handle this? Consider it done. I got this. Lord, please help me. I'll do it. So hold fast to the faith. Don't give up. God has great plans for your life. Great plans. Great things. Look at Paul the apostle. He was so far gone. People had written him off, and yet the Lord had chosen him to do such things that caused him to fall before the Lord, saying, Lord, you alone are wise. You alone are worthy of all praise. Lord, you are the most amazing, eternal, immortal God. Lord, thank you. Because God has great things in store. So you take that step of faith and obedience to him and then let the Lord work it out. Let the Lord take care of it. All we need to do is obey. And so I hope that you're encouraged today. I hope that you have gleaned a greater understanding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, actually a soldier of the Lord. And how when we signed up, it wasn't for the kiddie playground. It was for the battleground. And we won't be surprised 
when incoming fire comes our way, we know we're headed in the right direction. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for precedent after precedent, example after example of how you work and how you take ordinary people and do extraordinary things. Father, we look at our past and we say thank you for your great love and for your forgiveness. Here in the present, Lord, as we are walking by faith and not by sight because we can't see it and we don't know what's going to happen next. Yet we see your faithfulness. Your track record, Lord, is perfect. And Lord, we know that you will yet again provide. You will yet again intervene. You will yet again work all things together for the good because we love you and are called according to your purposes. And so, Father, fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit today. Give us strength for the battle at hand. If we have been losing, I pray that today we would begin to wage the good warfare, the warfare that we win through the power of your Holy Spirit, not leaning on our own understanding, but fighting the battle in the spiritual realm. Lord, open our eyes to see beyond our noses. Give us discernment. Give us wisdom. And help us, Lord, to step out in faith even when we don't understand, when we don't see, when we don't feel like it. And Lord, would you please empower us? Would you please use us as you would seem fit? And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. Let's stand. May the Lord bless you today and may he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you the peace which surpasses all understanding. And may it guard your heart. May it guard your mind through Jesus Christ, our Lord. God bless you and have a wonderful rest of your Sunday. And let's worship the Lord.